Hello, you fine creative people, and welcome to season two of Creative Insanity. My artist name is Servant. I am a rap artist and producer, and an author under my real name, Spencer Richard. Before I jump into this first episode, I want to make a couple quick announcements. First off, season two will run from today, October 12th, until July of 2022. They will air on two out of three Tuesdays on a three-week cycle. So that means there's an episode today on the 12th, another one on the 19th, no show on the 26th, and then we're back on November 2nd, and so on. Next year, like this year, I will be taking the summer off of producing the podcast so I can prepare for the following season. Uh, This is important because behind the scenes, I am but one man. I produce the show. I edit it. I send it off for distribution. I make contact with the guests. I do the marketing, and between releasing new music as servant, being a dad of three girls, and being a full-time freelancing videographer, 24 shows a year is about all I can commit to. I want doing this show to remain thrilling for me and have as much utility for you, and that's only going to happen if I don't work myself to death. That said, I'm still going to work. This show is available on all major podcast platforms and on YouTube as video. On YouTube, the video is published alongside my original music videos and behind-the-scenes footage uh, as I see fit because I'm an artist and I do whatever I want. It's my podcast and I can cry if I want to. I'll end with this. As you might already know, quality is paramount to me. Neither my guests nor myself are interested in wasting your time. And it doesn't matter if they have little followings or big followings. Everybody who has been asked onto this podcast has been selected because I believe they have something to contribute to the conversation. And what is the conversation? Why? It's creative insanity. (laughs) This is me being confident now. Creative Insanity is the discussion-based podcast to subscribe to if you are a creative person like me who wants to dive deep, who wants to surround themselves with intensely creative people, who wants to stay inspired, who wants to figure out how the hell to be and stay sane. My guests and I talk method and madness, music and mosaic, mystery, muse, and mayhem. This is Creative Insanity. Welcome to Creative Insanity. Creative Insanity. All right, so... My guest today is Cesar Santos. Cesar is a world-class painter and illustrator, perhaps best known for his immense ability in portraiture. Born in Cuba, later raised in the States, uh, now he resides in Italy with his wonderful wife, Valentina. To see his work is to be amazed. His highly instructive and insightful YouTube videos showcase his process and bring his viewers along what I would consider a most artistic journey. That he has over 150,000 subscribers to his YouTube channel means that I'm not the only one who thinks so. His art is sought after all over the world, and I think it's fair to say that his mastery in the craft has inspired thousands of artists like him. To tell you a list of our discussion points would be like trying to describe to you what water feels like. Let's just dive in. Uh, Cesar Santos, welcome to Creative Insanity. Thank you, sir, and I'm happy to be talking to you today. Yeah, me too. And let's just jump right into it. We because we we started, it was hard to stop. So we were talking about ADHD. I mentioned I'm ADHD, and I was kind of experimenting with some medications. Haven't had good luck with them, and I waffle whether or not I should be. And I didn't know I was ADHD until last year. And you had some interesting insight on that. Yeah, uh, the thing is that I believe we are all humans and we have a little bit of everything in us. Nobody is completely crazy. Nobody is completely sane. I think we are a mixture of everything. And today's world is very scientific, very labeled, very structured. And I don't think that is in harmony with, with nature. And as soon as you don't apply to what they think is normal, then they think that you have a problem. But it's just that it's almost like um, like the top telling people how they should be and what should be accepted. And if you don't apply, they treat you. And I think that is a problem because I believe in nature more than human creations. And I think uh, I think we belong, if, especially if we are creative people, 
nobody can put us, in, uh, can point at things, you know, like we are this organic thing that goes in moods and do stuff. And, and I don't believe you should be taking medications. I'm not a doctor, so please. <laughs> yeah, no, well, you, you are allowed to have an opinion, though, on the matter, so... And yeah, I, yeah, no, because I don't know if I'm actually harming someone by, by telling them that I don't believe in, in taking that type of medication, especially me. My experience has been since I was a kid in Cuba that I was also strange and my pro I couldn't read and I couldn't even focus on a sentence uh, even when I was under pressure like to read it in front of people. And I had these problems that might have been taken as a problem, but people laughed it off. I didn't think it was a problem. So, mm -hmm. but now, I, as I went into um, into the states because I was in Cuba, it was a different environment. People are allowed to be crazy. People are allowed to to be weird. Right. In that sense, I mean, we have no freedom anywhere else. But at least in terms of being natural, um, I think it's I, I learned to be just who I am and accept people how they are. And I think now we have a standard. And we want people to fit in these boxes. And if they don't, then we put medication into them to make them do that. And I think that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. I, I do appreciate your how candid you are with your opinion on that. Because I think a lot of people feel that way and think that way. But they're not open to discussing it in such light. Because there is a kind of political correctness around the idea of like medication. And it really it is something we need to talk about. Like... My rationale on it has been to avoid most of the time for myself personally because I had I got through 30 years of life without medication, without knowing I was ADHD, and it seemed as if though I've had struggles to fit in in society in some ways, I've also had a lot of immense gifts to to bring value to my life and to others' lives, and so it seemed like there's just a pro and con situation of being who I was, but the areas why I ultimately considered it was because I did seem to struggle with motivation. And I've been hearing a lot about maybe medication is something you should consider. And I am a very naturally curious person. And so at a certain point I started to think, well, maybe I could experiment. I could not be committal, not say this is how I am forever, but I could try uh, a low dose of something for a typical uh, prescription and see if it does anything immensely beneficial to me. And I can start with weed. <laughs> yeah. You know, I tried weed. I did. Uh, I had a, uh, I was one of those sheltered guys. I never tried it growing up. I think first time I tried it, I was 25. And I've probably had it, you know, five or six times in my life. But I have a friend who is like ADHD and he swears by it. He, he said, man, you got to try a bit of low dose, regular THC or something just to kind of help you focus. And I, and I tried it. Uh, first time I accidentally had too much. It turns out I'm very sensitive. I was very, very high. <laughs> and nice. <laughs> yeah, it, it was ridiculous. I couldn't stop laughing. I mean, I mentioned, I mentioned that because I believe um, naturally we have enough ability to deal with ourselves. And, and but we are not we get paranoid or think that something is wrong because people point it out or we label it as a, a name that we have. And, but I don't think it's like that. I think for centuries, for thousands of years, we evolved to, to deal with who we are. And I think it's more psychological. And I think we have to put into perspective the time that we, have, that we are living in, how we do have an umbrella um, kind of guiding us and if we don't find if we find ourselves in conflict we think there is something wrong with us but i don't think i don't think that's uh, true i think uh, there is a bigger reality out there that if you let that go and don't label it and, and just listen to your body what you need to do if you change direction and you deal with your psychology in a more natural way i believe that's even healthier than thinking oh my god there is something wrong with me what should i do you know but yeah. I mentioned the weed thing because it's just something that has been done yeah. for a long time. And it's a plant and it, it, it had bad, whatever, you know? I yeah, think, uh, it did, a lot of people, I know there's medicinal properties of marijuana for sure. And there are people who have tons of anecdotal experience. And I mean, it's becoming legalized in a lot of places. It is here in Canada. Um, that's the first, like, I only ever had weed in a legal sense. I never tried it otherwise. And... 
it's, I think, very worth considering natural ways to augment your life to suit you. And an example I was thinking of is last night, um, you know, we were uh, messaging through Instagram a little bit, and you're like, yeah, I got to uh, go to bed, and it's like 9 a.m. here or something. And I was like, what? Like, that is a not a normal pattern, you know, no. to be up throughout the night and then to sleep in the day. Is that something you find yourself doing a lot of, or are you just kind of... Uh, your circadian rhythm is it completely out of tune with our well that's the thing too that we have this order like every video you hear of motivational speakers or or doctors or people that recommend what to how to live better they say you know go to sleep early wake up early and yes it depends it depends for me i rather live with myself in if i'm creating something or either i set a deadline for myself or i'm excited about something I just keep going until I'm done with it. I don't yeah. want to go to sleep because it's time to sleep, you know? <laughs> so I actually, yesterday, I did my record. It's like 17 hours straight, just stopping two times to eat something and and painting the whole time. And uh, yeah, and if it's 9 a.m. that I finish, uh, then I go to sleep at 9 a.m. You know, I prepare a nice dark room to sleep comfortable and, and that's it <laughs> but, mm-hmm. but then but it depends you know it's, it, it depends on on the situation maybe i get sleepy in 20 minutes and i go to sleep then at the right time and but i think i just what i believe is that the night is as full as the day and even though you know they they add different aspects to our lives like the night is more subconscious is more quiet mm. the, like there's more mystery going on and I think we, if we're sensitive, we feel that. That's why there are things to do at night, like a fire pit or yeah. stories, you know, and then in the morning you have a different mindset. So you do. So I think every time belongs to its own rhythm like that. And if you fall for it, I think it's, it's totally fine. Yeah. Well, and I think some people, they're built more for, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, a sense of normalcy in modern society. Some people, they like to get up early. They like to go to bed early. They kind of settle into a routine very easily and naturally. And yeah. I think individuals like us uh, don't settle so easily into routines. And it's a, it's a struggle because I'm exactly the same way. If I'm in the zone on something that I want to get done, um, anything in my life that is between me and that thing is an obstacle of some kind. And it's all I want to do is keep that space clear so I can have this, this intimacy and intensity with what I'm trying to work on. And only when it's done very often, can I like step back and rest and, or, you know, immense exhaustion. Like I can't physically anymore, Yeah. but yeah, you got to, I tend, I tend to accept even interruptions, you know, because I believe that life is ahead of us is the one uh, take giving us the right is so if i if i have the time to paint 17 hours and i'm in the mood then i do it if something comes up and interrupts it i happily stop and do the thing because i think being aware of your surroundings especially if you brought it up onto yourselves i think it's fine to to do to do it and change you know and i think routine is really helpful i'm always trying to find a routine to kind of be comfortable in mm. you know in the rhythm but but if it, but yeah i keep breaking it because i keep starting something else but i i understand it's super useful to have a routine and to have things set up even here moving because i keep moving like with my wife i counted in in 15 years of marriage we lived in 12 different places in like three different four different countries and and that keeps that's why then when I prepare my studio, I make everything as comfortable as possible mm. so that then within that chaotic kind of rhythm, I have something that I can count on to have a routine that is productive and safe. Yeah, that's but, really smart. And I think that that's a very intelligent perspective on it. It's more nuanced. And I, I would equivocate it to like structure is something I thrive in, but I also reject it in a natural way very often. I don't want to be in the structure, but then when I'm forced into it, in many ways I do thrive and I have this kind. So it is important. You have to 
be willing to engage with it. And environment is so important as well, that you would set up your studio in a way in your home so that this becomes your comfortable place. This is your, your work zone, your fun zone, your everything, that all the chaos around it um, was well, just that. It's around it. It's not within it. And so that's important well, yeah, too. I mean, it- if I, when I looked uh, in nature, everything changes. Uh, a tree changes, even a cave changes. You cannot be in nature and have that type of structure that is safe and prepared. That is something that is fake. We made houses to not change. And especially this house is like from the 1500s. I'm like in yeah, Florence yeah. right now. And it's like beautiful to know this sto- the history of this. And it's, uh, for me as an artist, it's pretty cool. But I understand that it's also if an imposition on, on reality because nothing lasts that long in nature in the structure so that might trick my brain to thinking that life should be the same just because the walls are the same and the placement of things are the same but i had an experience before coming here living in a van for six months and and i understood how to be exposed to the weather to all the elements to the temperatures to things that can go wrong nothing stayed the same so it was really interesting to experience that for the first time um to realize that that is a a false to wanting to have something fixed it's just a an illusion that shouldn't be you know yeah uh, imposed well you need to remind yourself of our place in nature and how we are part of it and yeah too much artificial too much artificial will rob us of something some some mm-hmm. wildness that's there. You do you see life as art, or do you see life as mimicking art? I think I think life as a human is art. I I, I believe. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, that's a that's a very strange question. I never had that question. I like comparing art and life, you know, because I thought always that art was a way to live your life, you know, or not. Right. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. That's, that's an interesting question. So, what what do you want to? What do you mean by it? like what? Do you... I guess that I I feel the same way at the strangeness of the question because I. I look at art as a mode with which you can experience life for the most part. But then it also seems to me like you can take life in itself. It seems like all you need is a is a frame. All you got to do is put your fingers like this and it's art. Like everywhere you look and in every degree, it seems like there's something that can be extracted. And it made me think about the relationship. And Something that you do a lot, like you put out these excellent videos, um, sort of tutorial style, documenting your process that uh, your wife uh, makes with you. And uh, you guys do an excellent job. But not only do you talk about the process, about what are you doing technically, but your philosophy of life and art seems Mm -hmm. to infuse itself. And you will take these little moments where you'll talk about you know, like the night and the day, like for an example, you'll have this kind of philosophy work its way into the art. It's a very holistic view. And it got me thinking why I wanted to ask you, like, do you even see a separation between life and art? Because it seems like your ability to uh, dance from metaphor to metaphor um, has such, I don't know, it's just so uh, integrated that it seems like maybe there is no separation at all. No, that's very interesting. Now I see what you meant, because I believe that Art is studying nature. Like animals cannot do art because they don't have the time to think about themselves acting in the world. And so they are just that, they're just Mm. acting automatically. Everything is being run. But humans, when we study art, art, art came up. I mean, the principles of art belong to the principles of nature. And when we see like designs in nature, and we apply it, at least in architecture, they work. You know how something like a tree has to be thicker in the bottom and then it becomes smaller. Mm-hmm. And then every branch does the same thing. And even our arms do the same thing. Like they're thicker here, then thicker here, then thicker here, yeah. then thicker here. You know, so we are all structured. So once you're doing art, 
if you even singing maybe i don't know i'm really naturally bad at singing but i believe is your natural instrument reaching a potential with the personality of the of the creator you know mm -hmm. and 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 listening to birds and listening to sounds and trying to imitate that i mean i don't know how profound that could get uh for a musician or someone like that but it's definitely a feeling that it gives me that is in the moment it only it can only stay as you are doing it you know that's why like a theater or singing in live or a painting is a recording of an intense living experience that, right. that people want to experience outside of it so that's why i believe it, it is comparable like that hmm. regarding music um and your ability to dance with these metaphors, it seems, you know, very often you'll compare musical process that I, I found that's something we've kind of talked about loosely in the past is, you know, I do music primarily and uh, you focus in the visual arts and there's so many similar things about them that I was thinking, I almost wanted to ask you like, in what ways are they even dissimilar? It seems that there's so, you can pick one aspect and there's a comparison or a similar analogy in you know the auditory world versus the visual yeah. and so i was starting to think like well in what way are they special or different from each other other than they appeal to a different sense first yeah i think just the, the expression is different but the, all the principles are the same because for instance you can see when you're a younger artist in anything you have similarities everybody goes through the going extremes and you go dramatic at first or or kitschy to the extremes mm -hmm. and you're trying to find a balance it's almost like a kid like screaming to hear his own voice and then maybe whispering and then you know like you're or laughing and then crying immediately after yeah and i think art at the beginning has a lot of that uh and in regardless of what how you know if it's an instrument singing acting uh the most the most experienced artists find a very subtle way to express that and i think that's when you then you get mastery mm. in different genres because of that um you know combination of technique the skills that you needed to develop that expression gets really really in tune with your philosophy and your life so then your life becomes the art and then the art becomes the flower of your life mm -hmm. and then when people see it it becomes a fruit everybody wants it it's like it calls the attention but it's something that comes out of the nutrition like almost like as as invisible um as as a tree does it or as anything mm -hmm. you know in nature yeah like it it seems like you're saying you want your process to be as natural and organic and uh like truly reflective of you know, what is, what's real, you want that to be central because then it's going to produce fruit that is, uh, you know, more appetizing or of greater utility to others. Yeah, uh, the process is something strange because process, and I'm glad you mentioned it, because process, when we start learning the craft, they tell you process like so the school in at least in painting maybe something like poetry i don't know if they can tell you the process but maybe by reading poets you get the process down or grammar you know learning grammar yeah uh, but but there is a moment that you that the process that was once public uh like in a school teaching you a process how to paint or something once that process becomes personal and you start changing stuff to that process so that then you separate from the school or separate from the other people that inspire you. Mm -hmm. And but then you keep the integrity, you know, of the of the art, but then the process is the one that you change completely. So then the result comes out different too. Right. You know, because if, if everybody uses the same process, then the result is gonna have the same kind of elements to it and it becomes like a boring, predictable art type. Yeah, and it's almost like that's all we have control over. There are innovations in art in terms of the techniques of how things are accomplished, but um, there's immense creativity in 
the variance of tech, like how you can vary that technique and come at yes. it from different angles. And I think that's something that you're quite masterful at yourself is that you you seem to approach things non-traditionally. It's like, okay, if you think, here's a portrait, you know, portrait seems like a very traditional thing that an artist would pursue, mm -hmm. but you have these, uh, I don't know, like these methods and approach that your signature comes through in some unique way that it's, it's a portrait like there's any other portrait of any other artist of any other generation, but there is this unique uniqueness that comes uh, to the final product just from how you've altered your process and how you mess mm -hmm. around and stuff. And it's really fascinating yeah. to watch. Um, just to, yeah, just to give you a bit of praise here, I, I don't know how often you get to hear it, but there are few artists, so there's few people that when I see what they're doing, I think to myself, uh, that is impossible. That is not something that anyone can do. I, I literally don't understand. And you're one of those people that when I see the results of your work and then I see you doing your process, um, I, I can't understand it. Uh, you know, it seems like absolutely mysterious to me that you can take this paintbrush or a pen or something and your hand is doing something that doesn't even seem methodical. It doesn't seem thought out. You're just kind of mm -hmm. doing it. And then what can emerge is this, you know, masterwork. Um, I would say that for my listeners and anyone to, who, who knows your work, it's, it's a really great example of a true artist. And I hope I'm not flattering you too much or that. But... <laughs> no, it's fine. I don't even know because the funny part is that what I'm, I think that's the result because that's the experience too that I'm having. I don't even know how it comes out either. Like I know, I, I know that I have studied so long for it and I know that I have developed and by practicing you, I get more control that becomes subconscious. And mm. I'm glad that I've been able to develop my life around it so that I because I love it so much that even with people in my in my academic my contemporary school years who tell me that oh it has been done why pursue realism in a naturalistic way like that or limited to portraiture when when you describe it like that it looks like it has been done but when I feel it it feels like it's totally the creation of the universe you know yeah and then I'm huh. using all my my technology and my tools available but definitely i believe that when i'm looking at something i feel that i'm so into it and then the tool is trying to describe the feeling i'm do i'm i'm feeling like the feeling i'm getting by by going around it mm. with it with the whole experience of background and foreground yeah and that's something that cannot be labeled and and Put together in a coherent way other than maybe the schools teaching you like how to do a shadow how to yeah do it, you know? yeah it's like the difference between a swimming lesson and survival in the middle of an ocean it's like you <laughs> you get to get this education where they're like well you want to put your arms this way and you want to conserve energy and that that's what you do and uh it's all safe and everything is good but when you're really engaging with the art form that's more what it's like is it's you in these deep, dark waters utilizing things that you've learned, but there is a kind of, uh, there's a, a vibe or an energy to it that's hard to describe, I guess. I mean, maybe that's what because, it's like. You know what I mean? I mean, I think if I forget that I am anything and then I become the experience I can definitely believe that that will help the process because I see a lot of artists or painters or myself even before trying to create a painting or trying to separate myself from my creation. And I think that's a problem that we all do at the beginning because you're finding yourself out, how you look, what the feeling is. Mm -hmm. But there is a moment that you just say, I am going to become the experience without any expectation of any judgment, but I'm going to give my best. The only thing that I know is I'm going to give my best to become a master of whatever level I am at the moment. And then if you try that when you're really naive, 
you try the best and then that was it. And then you do it. But I think in time, then it becomes developed so that other people see the mystery. But inside of oneself, it feels as if you just became that same experience that you had when you were a kid and drawing. Yeah. You know? You, wow, you really articulated that really well. And it resonates with me as a musical artist because uh, there's an expression that I've come to love said, let the song write itself, you know, which is, yeah, yeah. you know, when I started writing poetry at first, yeah, I had this sort of disconnect where I'm creating this little piece of work and piece of art. And there are a lot of people who have this mentality where they're like, you know, you are not your art and you should really have this this schism in place separate yourself, protect yourself, man, protect yourself. And it's, um, I, I, uh, I've kind of grown through that and I've got, come to the point where my, I am immensely in the zone, authentically discovering what it is that I'm trying to, I, I'm just discovering. It's not like I'm trying to make something. It's like, I'm kind of following a trail somewhere and I need to just be honest and authentic and let it happen. And when it, when that happens for me correctly, I can see the difference at the end of the day. I can look at the, the song and go, there's something about this one that really jumps off the page. There's something immeasurably uh, beautiful to me about it. And maybe because it is more organic, like it is the more real, right? It's not a structure... Yeah, and it's a simple one, you know, always that works. Because, like, for instance, when you did the rap with Peterson's uh, poetry yes. in the back and then you added, that was a beautiful thing that came out almost intuitively like that, I believe, because all, because you had the joy, like, mm. you were enjoying the teasing and the responding and the thing. So, but I believe sometimes we become too serious also and, and we want to be like... We, without knowing, you know, we want to uh, make something work. And I think, but when you're with a loved one, when you are with something that really comes out as your character really jumps in the pool or not, you mm -hmm. don't think about it, how am I jump in the pool, you know, like, <laughs> and those moments are really tough to get. And I think, uh, yeah, once you get it, you see the difference and you're like, man, how can I do that again? And then <laughs> that's the wrong question because you shouldn't do that again. You should just feel the thing again, but yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, that, that's a thank you. That's a really great example. And that was a case, too. I had actually been inspired to do that partly from my podcast. I had a guest on an artist named Meredith Bull, and she's a singer in L.A., and she's a very talented actress, and she does a million things. And she was talking to me about just the philosophy of just getting stuff out there. And it was something that kind of was fresh in my mind. And then Jordan put out this little rap, or this, this poem that was, you know, it's very comical philosopher thing. They're all getting drunk. And I just had this momentary bit of inspiration of what if I took that and produced it to some, I made a little beat and I didn't get in my way. I just did it. I just immediately sat down. I started doing it and I, I wrote something that just sort of came naturally. I was trying to add and, and have fun with it and play. And it was, yeah, just this sort of joyful, silly experience. And it yeah. happened super quickly. Like it, it just, fl you know, flowed out. And then I had this little video that I, well, I, I threw it out there and then it resonated with him as, to some degree. And he, you know, shared it with others and that opened other doors. And it was, it was this bizarrely organic process that, I did step back and think, how could I replicate this? And I realized it was the wrong question. And I was like, you know, I don't want to replicate it. I want to, <laughs> I want to do something I different. I, I want to keep growing. I want to play in the same pool, but, you know. Yeah, because I believe that in, we are bombarded with too much information. And if we have any problem in the present times, is abundance of something. Every problem now is because of too much of something, you know? And I think that since we are bombarded and surrounded with all these people that do amazing stuff, or all these people telling us how to better live, or even ourselves with anything, everything is just full of stuff. So I believe even political stuff, you know? And sometimes, even I feel that that can get into me. So then my art has to say something about it and I have to stop it. 
because I understand that it's more it's more fulfilling if I just deal with what I experience, like at the at the table or something I see, or because if we start using all the stuff around us, we will always be incomplete because we mm. cannot belong because it's like a, like a fake world that we are experiencing, but we think it's ours because it came through our senses, but it came in a false way. It came through a screen or it came through a narrative that wasn't completely well presented to us. Yeah. And since we are like sponges and we are like this weird glue gooey thing <laughs> floating around space, I think we have to always keep that integrity and say, let me just stay limited to my own smallness. And that's when the bigger stuff happens. That's when you become universal. It's because you touch something so simple and so deep inside of you. But the problem with that today is that we are always tempted to not do that. It's like, go out, meet this person, do this, go, you know? And it's like tough. Even for me, like, I love the idea of sharing stuff, but I have to always keep myself uh, remembering, like, keep it kind of like, uh, you know? Yeah, you want to... I understand. Well, I think in your case, you have probably one of the best systems a guy could have for how you get your work, uh, you know, like for YouTube, for instance, how you get it out there. Like, you... You have this, you know, lovely partner who's also very skilled in what she's doing, and I imagine that the process is somewhat like she's probably driving a lot of it. She's like, "Hey, let's uh, I docu- She's documenting you as you're doing stuff, and you're. She's setting up cameras. Like I don't know what the process is like exactly, but it's a kind of thing that I imagine takes some pressure off of you to continually think to yourself, "Oh yeah, I gotta like make a video about this." Oh yeah, I got to do this thing so that people see and my following. And, you know, it sort of keeps you, it keeps you in the the safer space, uh, uh, less ego. You know, you just get to do the thing, and someone comes up and asks a question, and you answer it. You know. Yeah. No, for us, it's almost like an album of our lives because we never got like a like a normal wedding. We never do like normal things that normally people do in couples but since we live so artistically and we live so like into our world and she loves reading and she gives me ideas and we live together and these videos are mainly like a documentary of things that are important to us almost like an album that we can look back into back into our lives and revise moments and at the same time it's funny because other people enjoy it too almost like back in the days when they used to show the album and everybody oh, yeah. look at it and laugh you know <laughs> so it's kind of like a modern way to present an album if you if you enjoy, if you're enjoying you know your yeah. life with your loved one or with your craft or whatever yeah i i relate my wife is my main videographer so i i make my living primarily from video i did it music uh music was my entry point into it i started to make my own music videos and eventually people said hey you're good at the video can you help my business with this or could you make this and so i started to get freelance on the side and eventually it became this full-time thing uh where now that's my main money maker and thankfully it's in the, the realm of doing things that are of my interest and i'm talking to people and i'm, I'm interviewing and making artistic type things but my, I'm an artist who is center on the camera a lot if for my own music videos. I can't selfie myself, you know. I need someone to film me that has the right sensibilities and can work with me as a director. And my wife is that person where she's the primary film person who works with me. And it's nice. really cool. Now, every time I'm doing a music video, I get another person or a friend or a brother or something to help get behind the scenes. So we get a lot of stuff of her filming me and us working together and um, the whole collaborative experience of it when putting it out there. And it really does start to feel like this album of, remember this music video? Like, here's the behind the scenes footage and we, I can just look at it and be like, this was a great time. Uh, just a good, really cool way to document life, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah, that's for sure. So I'm... I'm led to actually want to ask you a little bit about relationships because I'm a bit curious how you've been married for, said, 15 years, right? And yeah. what, living a kind of unorthodox lifestyle as you do, not many people are artists doing what you do and uh, the the challenges and the freedoms that come with that kind of lifestyle. What have you learned about 
you know, marriage or about relationships in the space of your unique kind of life that would, I'm just curious, like, what have you learned? What yeah. works? What doesn't work? That's an interesting question. I, I love talking about this, you know, like, this is funny because normally I am with art and, you know, colors. So this is <laughs> a, a new type of conversation. That's nice. I, I think, well, I always had the privilege to have good parents. So I always saw a, a, well, a good working couple in my parents. And, and I always, when I would hear in school things about, you know, like um, encouraging people to stay single or like our culture has a lot of moments that they give you these hints to not appreciate uh, the value of being together and sacrificing things to, for the gain, for, to gain bigger stuff in a relationship. And I never, it never makes sense to me. So I always thought that I'm incomplete. I'm one side. It's almost like my left side of the brain, not having the left, the other, the right side. So I always thought that having, and I always love the company of women more than guys because I used to box and I used to be with some friends. And for some reason, maybe since I was a little kid, I would draw a girl and she would love it more. She would yeah. like it. And then she would ask me to do something. So I think since, since I was a little kid, I, I realize that having a good company of someone so opposite from you is really, really good for you. And, and but it came almost like a natural thing. Um, but I did pursue it. Like I try, uh, you know, to, because it, it's not a matter of being lucky, finding the right person. Nobody's right. You have, to, how do you know that you are right for someone else either, you know? Right. And what I, what I yeah. So <laughs> I just know that we are organic things and we are meant to be together by nature all the animals have couples in different forms and we are have couples too we come from couples and i think if we cherish that if we respect that and we say okay let's try to have the best experience with someone else and if i find something i never took like i never thought of taking away from me if she wanted to do something but there is i do believe that there is this tension between people because we became separated from the world as science developed and science labeled everything right. and separated everything. Um, people detach themselves from God and from culture and from all this stuff. I mean, not separated, uh, mentally mm -hmm. insisting, but we cannot be alone for long, yeah. for a long time. We are always looking for people. I mean, naturally, we look for people, music, books, people around us yeah if you put someone alone that's the well that's solitary confinement yeah, that's the torture. worst punishment <laughs> yeah we're communal creatures so, absolutely yeah so the first thing we have to say is to accept that and also to accept that our time is is not doesn't know how to appreciate that because you cannot measure that and science love measuring and if they cannot measure it and point at it they kind of don't do don't deal with it but i'm like there are so many things that are more important than what you can measure that actually acts because we are stories we are feelings we are all this stuff mm -hmm. that science cannot track because they can only work with facts and an experiment and doing something that already worked and that's not life at all you know i believe that uh we are supposed to be what with you know how we are not how mm -hmm. we think we are you know yeah, that's a good point. It's science is something that can, the way that I think of it, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, it seems like when I have these conversations, uh, but science doesn't ever answer the question why. It can't. Science is really a how kind of phenomenon. It, you know, you could say, why does the earth orbit the sun? Or like, why do, you know, why do we go around the sun? We can kind of go with the hows. We can say, well, you know, the sun is a great mass, and what we've determined is that there is this law, this immutable law of gravity where mass attracts mass, and, uh, you know, it seems like we get in this kind of weird loop. So, you know, like, we have these hows, but when a child asks maybe, why do we go around the sun? That's a different question. It's, it's not something that science can answer. You cannot answer a why with a how. And so... There is so much more beyond life, and, and people use science as a kind of bat or as a tool, like this is the way the world is, and they theorize 
from science and then they call that science. And it's not exactly that. And it's yeah. neat how, yeah, it's neat how you tied that into relationships and how it's like, uh, it's almost a rational place to start. Like we need to be with people. I love being with women in particular because it's so opposite and, and there's there's so many gifts that I find particular delight in. Uh, so it seems like a kind of natural thing. And then I imagine you, you also said um, like you don't find yourself taking from yourself, like reducing who you are to be, to supplement another person. Uh, yeah. Tell me a bit more yeah, about and that. Yeah, it could happen. And, it, and in my case, is this is like this. But I believe maybe that someone else can have a different feeling completely. You know, and maybe they say, you know, I mean, of course, if you have homosexuals enjoying a different type of attraction, I understand that that could be natural too. So I'm just talking about my experience. Mm -hmm. But definitely, we have separated ourselves with the world. So then we know we we are kind of asking, what should we eat? You imagine at this time, in um, this, after thousands of years, we are asking ourselves, what should we be eating? Like, <laughs> that for me was so funny because I grew up in Cuba. There's nothing to eat. Whatever is eatable, you eat. Whatever whatever was meant for you to eat, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, as human, we should eat it. I mean, <laughs> I, can't, I don't understand the problem with eating, you know, like, and I understand that it could be my naive and my limited point of view. I don't have a problem with that, but that's why we are talking. It's just, that's what we do nowadays, experience each other's yeah. experience and then kind of calculate from there. But but there are things that we have in our time that I believe are just funny and I don't want them in my life, you know? Yeah, no, I respect that. I think that it's it's a it's a very good choice on your part to not overly concern yourself with things that are kind of, they're natural you know because the response will be better like for instance let's say an artist develops a, a technique to do shadows right and then they say okay uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna oh for instance the school teaches the shadows when you paint it they should be smooth they should have one color they shouldn't have that much detail they shouldn't have contrast but when I look at that, it comes from looking at nature because shadows in nature looks like smooth, one same color. Hmm. It doesn't have that much contrast. So everything that is now teachable was discovered by someone as an as an, a spontaneous discovery of really observing and really being like that. But then when it, once it works, then you share it and then other people do it mechanically. Mm -hmm. And then it might look like a shadow because you follow the norm, but you didn't have the experience of looking really at the shadow and painting it as you felt. And we have this throughout life. Like they say, sleep this many hours, eat this, shower cold or warm, or and all these structures, if maybe don't apply to the people, to the person, you know? Yeah, or certainly not um, all the time, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's good to... That's why it's good for me to listen to my family more because even though they didn't have a college degree, they had experience and they were, and they had the best. They knew me. I knew that like we live together mm -hmm. and, and I, I, we, we evolved in my household to be together, learning from each other. And I think the universe can be in a little house with four people. <laughs> um, yeah, it absolutely you know can. It, no, yeah, it, that's totally how can. animals thrive. You know, they don't care about the other animals. They just like mm -hmm. look at their surroundings and respond in the best way to, to whatever they encounter. And I and I believe like living like this is nicer. You know. Yeah, the nuclear family is it's like the whole building block of the universe. That's something that I think Jordan Peterson has had some thoughts on. That is a guy that I admire, and we. It's like you can your parents can be can be representative of the whole world you know and certainly when you're very small that that's exactly what they are and there's so yeah. much more out there oh man you say so many things that honestly they they put me into this state of contemplation that makes me feel like it's hard for me to maybe articulate the right question to come at you with because i'm just sort of in awe thinking about these things does that make sense 
No, yeah, it's funny because I'm actually saying stuff that don't go with, you know, the normal thing to say is like, oh, I wanted my independence. I left my family and went yeah. to Europe because I was tired of that small town and I didn't have opportunities, you know? But I, I, I look like I did that because I did that, but I didn't <laughs> do it with that intention. Like I talked to my family and we are together and I'm always present if I have to be. And But we do have to compensate for our limit time mm-hmm. mentality of of individualism, separating yourself from everything, your family, your couples, your food, yeah. your showers, you know, and acting like if you're alone and not know. Because if you ask, this is funny because in painting, I cannot separate you from your environment. Yeah. When I when you look at me, you look at the back all the time. The back becomes secondary if I'm more interesting, but if you you cannot take it away because if you zoom in so much that you don't see the background, then you don't see me either. Then you don't know who I am also, because right. when you zoom in, you... So, it's in, so in nature, I learned that, I think, from Alan Watts. I think that's the one who said that. I don't know. But, but that's a very interesting point, um, that we, we don't know where we begin and where we start. If we are on an airplane looking down, we see a city, like an octopus, and then you see lines moving and that's us. We made that, we are walking through it. But if you go into it microscopically, you go in through the skin, you breathe, you, the air came in, the visions came in, the taste is all vibration. So you can become like dumb in thought if you think that we are nothing or that we, that we are everything. Like that's why yeah. it's open for interpretation. We don't know who we are and it's better to just experience life from whatever point of view we are on all the time, you know? Yeah, I think that's very humble. And your point about backgrounds, uh, it makes me think of a good comparison between art and music is, you know, if you are, there's a painting you did recently. Uh, it was a nude. It was of this this, uh, this beautiful mm-hmm. woman who she had her, uh, she had blonde hair and she kind of had this slight uh kink to her hip the direction she was going yeah like this massive thing it seemed like bigger than you and how how big yeah, it was and i was looking at some of your uh like how how you did it and what you're saying here about background is really present in that portrait because it's not just this simple shadow you had so many you know it's like blue and there's so much else going on in there that i wouldn't have expected and you you did these backdrops with a very small brush compared to, I mean, you could have taken a roller to the thing. Some people would think, yeah. you know, but you went through very meticulously to uh, give it this extra sort of life. And, Air, yeah. and in music, when you are making a song, you know, the vocals, the story you're telling or whatever it is, it's like that's the subject in a way. That's what we want to pay attention to. But the way that we we mix it is we're trying to create a full body of sound so that the span of frequency that the human ear can hear, it is, it's a full landscape. And so even though, and if you do a bad job mixing, the subject or the vocals are going to be too prominent and they're going to be separate from the background. If you do a good job, they're together with the background but still clear and concise. You know, it's like this kind of interesting unity. And so it's a neat metaphor between the two art forms and it's a, like a great metaphor for life about like you need to be, assimilate yourself in with the background somehow. Yeah, if you're talking to a romantic, you, you're a romantic dinner and you're happy, everything around becomes as happy as the person that you're talking to. You know, you cannot mm. separate it. The moment you become bad, like mentally, everything becomes bad. You know, like yeah. one room could be so romantic and then in a year you depress and you kill yourself in that room. You know, like yeah. it, 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 the room is nothing. It's all, that's why it's important to, yeah, to unify that the background is us. Everything is us, the way we are seeing it. So once we understand that, that goes beyond separation and labeling and, and describing all this stuff, you know. Do you think it's, much about, in a temporal sense, the idea of background? Like, do you think about the past a lot or the future, where you're going? It, I, I, my guess is that you 
be very present focused. But yeah. do you still find yourself in these territories and what is that like? Oh, that's funny. I, I mean, I think we have no option but to gauge and to predict, you know? So if we had a bad experience, I think most people would say, man, I don't want that to happen again. Why did, what happened? And then you kind of follow some points to get you to there and you say, I won't do those points again, but maybe something else happens. So I learned to not look at the, at the past other than to accepting your nutrition. Like I just look at the past saying, that felt good, that worked good. Yeah. Like I'm glad I made those decisions, but I let, I let my present because it depends on also, like if you're in a good mood, you have different thoughts than if you have yeah. that you were in a bad mood. So the past is nothing other than in the present. The present is the one that always rules. Even if you think of the past, you're still in the present, you know? And even if you think of the future, you're still in the present. So why would you, knowing that you're always in the present and everything comes from the present, why would you not take advantage of that to then really be aware of the present. And that is the best way that I do it. Because once you're sitting around, looking around and sit, not thinking as much, and if thought comes, you play with them. We're supposed to be thinking, you know? But yeah, I do love being in the present. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, I, I think most everything else is, there is no other, I mean, everything else is just a concept. <laughs> the only thing that existed always was the present. That's true. Yeah. You, you only ever have this moment. It's not a, I, you know, I think there's, there's utility in having, you know, some reflection, obviously being able to look back and say, yeah, you know, these decisions, um, they inspire gratitude in me. You know, like I'm grateful for, for where I'm at or, you know, what happened. And I mean, even people who have had miserable things happen to them or miserable choices that they've made very sometimes you know you ever hear of post-traumatic growth there's people <laughs> yeah it's it's a legitimate concept in psychology that they're studying more because it's an example of like a soldier goes off to war and loses a couple of limbs one soldier may return home and be so severely traumatized by that that they you know they lean into the drink more and they fight with their wife more and it causes problems and it ends terribly but there may be another soldier who's gone through the same situation where they come back and they, it refuels an appreciation for their life of what remains and also of what their purpose is. And so it fuels in them a kind of growth. And sometimes when people go through that, they reflect on the past and think, yeah, you know, those times my legs got blown off was the best thing that ever happened to me because it created me who I am today. And though I wouldn't wish I'd go through that in a lot of ways and no one wants to go through it, I'm grateful for who I am and how it's come. So like, I think having some reflection on the past is good if maybe you're reflecting, you know, well on things and you're not ruminating and, and dwelling there. Uh, and then the future, I think there's a similar kind of relationship. If you maybe look to the future and say, you know, where would be an interesting place to aim my life towards? What would be kind of cool? What what excites me looking forward to? Dwell in that space a little bit and you maybe let that influence your present, but you can't stay there, you know? Yes, that's 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 beautiful because when when I imagine my future is to take it seriously. So I have to become that immediately. And that's something I always felt. Like if I wanted to become a collector in the future, an art collector, um, I would just become one at the moment. Like if even if mm -hmm. I didn't have money, I'm like going to some kid and be like, hey, let me see your drawings. Oh, you want to trade that? Yes, yeah. let's do it. <laughs> I became a collector. So as long as you do that and be honest and say, you, you're going to say, I'm going to start a diet Monday. Like for me, I never thought of that as a practical thing that works because you have to be the diet in the moment. Yeah. Otherwise, it won't work, you know. So that's there's a lot of people saying that you become change the identity first of you to, of who you envision yourself to be, and then that's how you go to the gym because you change from lazy to athletic, 
And even though you might be overweight, you're in your mind, you're athletic. So mm. you're supposed to go to the gym because that's what athletic people do. Right. And then that's, dif- that's different than saying, oh, I need to change. I need to do this. Uh, nobody needs to do that. Everybody can be what they are in the moment and accept. And if you're honest and you say, I want to start the diet on Monday, but I'm going to start eating right now. If you're really honest, you're like, I'm eating now. That's what yeah. I am. Like, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Man. Yeah. I, don't, I don't eat food. I don't like that much. Like, I don't enjoy food that much. So this example oh, was the worst example. <laughs> Yeah, I I wondered about that. I was going to ask, like, why did you pick Italy to go to? And actually, I I asked my family, my immediate family, my brothers and sisters. I was like, oh, you know, I'm interviewing Caesar Santos, and um, you, they have all been to Italy. They, many of them, anyway, they've all traveled there. And I thought, is there any questions I could ask Caesar that are that maybe have some context of the country he's gone to that I would have not thought of because I've never been there. And, uh, it was an, I saw, it's interesting that we kind of led here. Cause I did want to know why Italy and my guess would be, is it because it has such a vibrant art community there and there's so many sculptures and does it just an inspiring yeah. place to be? Yeah, though, though it has many answers. I met my wife in Florence. I came to study here at a very crucial time in my life where my, I was about to finish college and I couldn't paint because they didn't, they didn't teach painting. Hmm. And my parents did a crazy sacrifice to send me here to a school that was here in Florence in 2005, I, I did that. And, and that also created like this powerful place in my mind because I had to finish school fast. I didn't even go to museums when I lived here. Um, and I just exercised, finished the school, learned the stuff, and went back to Miami to make a living. So in my mind, I always came back a year, like uh, yearly to either to visit my wife's family in the north hmm, okay. uh, of Italy or to give workshops. So one reason could be that. Another reason is that I'm turning 40, like I'm 39 now, and I want to set myself up because I believe like I learn from my own paintings and my paintings, it's all about setting myself up so that I can add more information and that I can enjoy like a better surface to paint on all the time. And I believe that our um, different times, like in our, in our lifespan requires different things. So now I'm, I was, I already used uh, my life in Miami and now I needed more like to go deeper, like to go to a more romantic hmm. side with the art, like you said, or the lifestyle of not having cars and walking everywhere, being a couple of blocks from everything I need in my life. And and then, so yeah, I just wanted a more simple life and like deeper and also in a way that I would escape the, the, the craziness, I believe uh, a little bit of the, um, uh, neurotic state of our culture mm. um, and it's overwhelming us and this place has such a deeper roots that it's harder to you know it's, i mean it's easier to stay in your own world type of thing. yeah yeah well well it's easier to stay in your own world while simultaneously existing as part of that background right like you're walking to the grocery store i mean you're going and um you're participating in life but you have this lovely domicile that is it, yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. I've thought about living abroad. I've thought about traveling, but I haven't thought much about it. Growing up in Canada, I'm more, I mean, I have these beautiful mountains nearby. It's very spacious. We have very wide roads here. Uh, it's really, I've, I've really come to the mentality at this stage in my life, and I'm just 31 now. I think I just want to appreciate where I'm at and really explore my immediate surroundings, but I know that I think creatively to myself that I would love to travel to different places for the purpose of participating in something creative. So if I was to ever go to Italy, um, well, I'd want to meet up with you and have a, have a oh, pint or something, you know, like, and I'd want to talk art. I'd want to see art. I'd want to go to museums. I'd want to, um, I'd want to do something creative. And to me, it's like the travel experience is t- 
tied simultaneously with that. I go to Vancouver to visit a friend. We do something creative. We make a video. You know, I, I did a short film recently that hasn't come out yet. That's sort of where I'm at right now. I'll travel if it's creative, but... No, yeah, please, if you pass by, yes, definitely. Stop yeah. by and let me know. No, I'd love that. No, me. absolutely. Oh, I just wanted to tell you just quickly, because I believe that you are in the right mindset. Like, you need, I believe everybody is where they are, and that is all they need. Unless you really had a block for some reason, and then you need to. So I believe it's better to live than live, to like to go somewhere else than live frustrated. But if you can appreciate what you have and know that anywhere you go, you're taking yourself and you might bring that frustration. And in time, just because it's different, you might get distracted. Mm. But then in time, you go back into the same problems. That is not going to cure the, the psychological problem. But I believe the moment you, you can appreciate and be grateful and you know, enjoy your environment, that's all you need. Imagine like having all those... Uh, that nature around you, all that is powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and we cannot be in a place that has everything. So, but now we see videos and we see all this stuff and people in small towns cannot wait to leave, you know? And right. So, but I'm always like trying, and I always move around. So I'm not even a good example to be saying that, but I did always enjoy where I am until I'm not, and then I just live. But I never live with frustrations or living, mm -hmm. like it's, it's good to accept nature and accept where you are and accept who you you know absolutely because instead of wanting to be something else you know yeah you you need there's well you know that thing i said about art is just anywhere you point this thing it's really true and if you do that in your own environment there's bound to be something you can find and yeah like i'm i'm in this bizarre situation because i'm legitimately in a very small town the population of the town i live is between eight and ten thousand this is a very small town, and we don't have um, massive city-like art infrastructure. We don't have so many things. And at first, existing in this small town, I grew up in the town nearby, which was the same population. Uh, I resented. I felt... But different people. Yeah, different people, yeah. I just felt don't like... Don't count the same number of people if they're different. No, <laughs> <laughs> yes, different people. I just felt like... I got to get out of here because I was frustrated. It's like I wanted to connect to the arts community. I wanted to be around people more. And I wanted, I had this sort of frustration. And somehow my life navigated myself back to another small town, uh, you know, for other reasons. And I was struggling at first. But then when I leaned into it and when I started to say, you know what? Yeah, I do rap music and I'm in a small town in Alberta, the kind of place that's not known for rap music. Oh, well, you know, I can do interesting and unique things here in my environment that make me like, yeah, I don't have to be held back by the environment. I can just harness my environment and it's going to come out differently, but it doesn't mean it's of less value or note or anything. I've, yeah. I've learned so much recently in how I've embraced my community and businesses and getting people to help me with various things like I've done some pretty sweet stuff in this small community that you wouldn't guess could be done. Uh, no, of course, and, and art is it cannot be predicted. That's why you are who you are, and it's always a surprise to people because we see other artists and how they develop, and, uh, and we think that being there is going to be easier, but I honestly don't believe that. Like, I'm here because of personal reasons, but I'm not, I mean, in Florence, it's not the place I'm going to be maybe having exhibitions or I'm, I didn't come for that. It came more for like the nourishment of my mm -hmm. interest. I want to go and study the past. I always loved history. So for me, it's important. But what I, but what you're saying is, is, is very nice because everybody develops in their environment. And, and, and if you accept that, it could create incredible things, like you're saying, you know? It doesn't have to be like they premeditated, go to a city, go to an important school, yeah. meet the right person. That's not, it never works no. like that. When you see like successful people, they tell you a story, you're like, how the hell did that work? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, it, and that's what's happened to me is that I've leaned into my environment. I've leaned in, learn, looking for what I love and capitalizing. And my podcast, uh, I, you know, 
I've been connecting with individuals that I would never have suspected I could connect with originally from that place of frustration, thinking like, here I am all alone and isolated. And then my life becomes a manifest opposite example just by a change in my attitude, where now I am connected to people all around the world. And I, I talk to massively creative individuals from different places, and I collaborate sometimes with massively interesting creative people. And I have great opportunities that wouldn't have existed, I think, unless I, I did learn to embrace things. And I mean, you, you have to make the most of life or you should make the most of life. And that's something that people easily forget when they are frustrated. They, they fall yeah. into a kind of, I think that frustration gives a kind of power to a person and anger. It's like, I may be in a miserable situation, but I'm right that I'm in a miserable situation. I am above and more powerful than this thing. And it's like this sort of negative cycle where a lot of people stay stuck there. And nothing changes. Yes, because I think we, we think that that's a problem. I think most people think, oh, I feel anxious or depressed or something. And we think that that's bad because it feels uncomfortable in our system. But if, if, if I learn to enjoy uh, life, like if I feel depressed and I don't want to paint, I enjoy that. I go and lay down for a whole day. Like, or, like it doesn't matter. Like it's nice to be living and with all the variations and, and I think if you get hurt, that's what it is. It's interesting. Like, oh, look at my body. How funny that it hurts. I can't move that, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you say, whatever, you know? But the problem is thinking, insisting that your mind should be beyond what happens and not surrender to what happens as a natural cause that you belong to and you should just in, uh, take the best out of it. It's almost like uh, when you people take birds and put it in a cage. The birds trying to do it its best anyways with that circumstances because we are these organisms that are always trying to thrive and take what mm -hmm. we need to move along and it, it comes with everything people say oh how do we have how to be happy like why do you want to be no you will be happy and you will be sad and you'll be everything don't <laughs> worry about that <laughs> like you cannot expect it otherwise you won't be happy if you're looking for it all the time you know <laughs> yeah absolutely uh I, I'm a big believer that uh, you've got to have the right mindset of priority and that if the wrong thing is in the first priority, like happiness, for instance, this is what you're after, every single thing below it is out of place. Nothing will line up. Everything's shifted down or, or you know, not in the right way. And I think, uh, I don't know, do you, is, what would be at the top of your hierarchy? Like what, what is it that is the, the right? The present. Whatever it is at the moment, like right now, you're the top of my hierarchy, because right now I'm talking to you and I'm interested in what, in what this conversation is giving me, and mm -hmm. I live it, you know. And then after this, I don't know, whatever comes up, I I live it. But the, the th people think that they're gonna forget what they have to do, or you're not gonna forget. You're an animal. You go automatic, you know. <laughs> and 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 all you have to do is be aware of the moment and then whatever you have inside of you will come out in the best possible way. But if you interrupt it, trying to force your thoughts, then you, you, you are a hindrance to, to yourself. Like right. that. And I see that happening a lot, you know, Oh, I want to go there, but people are going here. Just don't worry about that. Just stay where you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. It's, I think it's uh, what's the word? Efficacy the ability to do what you set out to do and how you talked about this sort of immediate response to like desire, if you will. It's like, this is something that I want to do. I do the thing. I want to be a collector. I start swapping cards with my buddy until I'm a collector. Um, you immediately enact the kind of do it, men do it now mentality is it's probably, it's, it's more natural state. And it's something that people can trick themselves out of and they can become their worst enemy. They can antagonize themselves where they have an instinct. Like in a social anxiety, for instance, someone is, they want to be accepted. They want to be friends. They want to be in the mix talking to these people at the party and they, they want to enjoy the company of others. But then this thing gets in their head and says, oh, everyone's going to look at you and they're going to judge you. Ah, you know, 
you know, you're not really that funny, so don't try to be. You're going to get all these negative thoughts, and it prevents them from having, if they were to have not had that dialogue internally, just go forward and sit down and laugh at the first thing you find funny and start getting into it. Like, it just, you got to, yeah, have that efficacy. Do something when you have the urge to do it. Yeah, I, like accept whatever outcome. Even if you feel like, oh, they're not going to accept me when I stand there and talk to the people. I think everybody has different backgrounds and sometimes we have been traumatized by family members or by bullies in school and like everybody's life happened in different ways and that does shape us and it's hard to make people understand things if they haven't lived it or they don't know what it is you know um so so it's so tough that's why i just rather be as possible with 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 my environment and and accept it and move from it than i mean what you're saying looks like a problem like mm -hmm. you know like people do all these sort of things um i wouldn't know how to how to fix that <laughs> well it is yeah it you're right because your your approach is like it seems kind of big like what how do you deal with that and it's a something that a lot of people find on their own personal journeys but you know the answer just so often seems get out of your own head get out of your own way that seems to be very often a solution to these problems and it's like a kind of uh, i like simple psychology I mean, don't get me wrong i love the complex stuff i love rationalizing my way through um, all these different lanes of traffic and coming to some cool location in my brain. I like doing that, but That's nice. it's, it's different that experience intellectualizing a way to improve myself or get out of the situation or do something better versus like Jocko Willink, an ex Navy SEAL saying, um, how, how do you get up when you want to get up in the morning? I don't know. You get up when your alarm goes. It's like, of course, it's just simple. Like you don't have to walk through this giant uh, ownership. Yeah, <laughs> taking ownership. I love that. I love his book. It was very nice. No, but I believe that the varieties was beautiful. What people don't understand is that we cannot be one thing and we cannot all behave correctly. It's impossible. We always, if we chase this type of mindset, our culture will always be in conflict and we'll always have our same problems. Because the only thing that is in our way is ourselves, not accepting the variety of life. So if we think that something is unjust in the world uh, and we judge it, that we are harming ourselves. Uh, and if, if someone does something wrong to you and you respond, you're making it worse. Like, I believe it's better to just understand that there is an infinite variation and we are going to experience most of those uh, options like uh, variations ourselves so, and um, we are a little bit of everybody we are a little bit of the worst people and we are a little bit of the best people mm -hmm. and i believe if we see it and we don't judge it we let everybody be timid if they don't want a crowd or if they're depressed what can we do like but I, my in my case i hope to see ourselves as thousands of years old or millions actually because we look like a fish when we're in the womb and we like develop this weird, in a weird way that nobody questions, but that's important. Like, you know, that's how we actually come from. Yeah. <laughs> and we have such a big baggage, physical and psychological, that I don't want to fall into the trap of my own times mentality. And that's my only resistance is to see things that come as just, and I have to see it, was that a natural thing or was that a trend? Huh. And if I see it as it's just limited by our time, I tend to just accept it and disregard it and not take it really seriously. If I see something that is it comes from our nature, then I think, okay, it's in harmony. Uh, and it's, it's, it's within the universe. And that's, uh, that's fine, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big theme that I've noticed in our conversation is it's the returning to what is natural. And I think, I think a lot of people can recognize quite easily if they're being objective, what is natural versus what is not natural? And that's, maybe that's just a good way to interpret your choices in life or to help help guide you towards what is the best for you is what is the most organic choice here? Maybe, maybe there's a way though that can get misused, you know what I mean? Like 
you could uh, yeah, because find yourself subject to carnal to... desire all the time and just be like, well, I'm just an animal, right? So No, but we are an animal that have reason. But we know that through reason, we are also separating ourselves from nature. And then we, we have to be ready if we do something by reason and then suddenly and a flooding comes and takes away our crops. And then we have to accept that as part of the game. Mm. And so I don't, for instance, right now we are living in a fake world because thanks to, so it's not natural. I mean, it's natural that we invented all this technology that we can talk. So we have, I accept that. And I accept that I have artificial lighting because the sun is, is not present in my life right now. And if I would be natural, I'll be in a dark room talking to you and not even be able to talk to you. Yeah. So I, as long as I play and I say, okay, light is an imitation of the sun. So I'm living in a fake environment right now. My, my pupils are thinking that there is light, but it's only a fake light. So I'm not in accordance to the rhythm of nature, but I, it's okay. So then I, I know and I separate myself from that. So if I have a shower, if I take a shower with warm water, I know that also that's not natural. When I lived in a van, I realized how difficult it was to get a warm hmm. water. It was impossible. All the rivers were cold, all the lakes yeah. were cold, the oceans were cold. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, that, and even water in the tank of my van was cold. So normally it's fine then Wim Hof comes and says cold showers are great yeah and you're like of course that's natural every animal will be sick all the time because they only have cold water to shower. <laughs> so then you know like as long as I play with the idea of of what we have made to help us be more comfortable and what is too much comf comfortability that is actually taking away from our natural power then you know it's like a game like that yeah but i got a question for you that that so you do seem physically like you're in a decent shape like you seem like you take care of yourself reasonably and this is just yeah. based off observation through the internet on my part yeah look at those pipes <laughs> but i you know i wonder like is that natural sort of, do you have a physical routine or is there something like that you do to keep yourself in relative shape? Or is this sort of just like a blessing of genetics and you're really just doing this all day? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, really? I, I work, yeah, yeah. I, the problem started when I was a kid because as a kid, I'm like narrow shoulders. I'm more like a round type of person. I'm not very athletic in the sense of like natural condition, thoracic, right. you know? Um, so I was kind of smaller and the girls would always get the bigger guys in yeah. Cuba. I mean, I was 12 years old. I'm talking about like really young and <laughs> middle school, high school, you know? Yeah, I've been there. And then, so I, so yeah, so my dad put me into boxing because I didn't, I'm not aggressive at all, or, but I always, I'm always like hyperactive. So, uh, I, I understood the power of exercising and through exercise, we experience symmetry. And, and, and symmetry is the main thing in nature that runs us. Like we love symmetry. We are in the middle of both of us uh, decided that almost intuitively um, that maybe you read something that says, get in the middle of the camera. But even if you didn't read it, you get yourself in the yeah. middle of the camera. Because <laughs> when you stand, you look for symmetry. And when you look at someone beautiful, it's symmetry. Mm -hmm. And paintings is all about that. So everything, a tree grows like that too. And if we are exercising, we practice that. In the morning, when I'm sleeping, we spend all this time like that. So I feel in the morning that I need to kind of stretch and experience my body, almost like if I'm being born, like looking at my potential. Right. So I love doing in the morning, like exercising. I get up and I stretch and I do even weights um, or shadow boxing, mm -hmm. uh, even for 30 minutes. Um, and that already wakes me up more than anything food or anything you know um so i do believe that we are in this body we are limited um in that sense so if we try to to be in the most friendly way with it mm. uh, i think it's a better life than if you become your enemy of your body you know <laughs> yeah i think an interesting video idea uh for valentina would be to have your workout routine in the morning or or just be like you know and today 
you know, I'm working on this painting and we're going to go with the very first step. And the first step is getting pumped, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. It feels nicer when you're painting and you already exercised, you know? Um, it's true. And yeah, and we, for, we forget it. We forget it because we are too comfortable. We think that it's uncomfortable to do it. But I believe everything that is uncomfortable is kind of good for us uh, that, at a level that we don't understand it. And if we just follow through and be uncomfortable, it's good. Like it's good to feel sweat and hot and mm. put up with it. It's nice to feel the rain fall and get soaked. And it's not, you know, like cold showers or hunger, like all this stuff are good, I think. They're not yes. like, we're like a little bit hungry, eat a little bit of this, so, you know, yeah. like we don't live. Uh, exactly. If, what your comments, they resonate. I recently spoke to another artist named Graham Robinson, and he is based in Toronto. And he does northern style canoes and artwork, and he has this really cool style. And um, I recently spoke to him. He's also going to be part of season two of my podcast. And we talked about physicality because he had a history of alcoholism and then he came to sobriety and was bored for like three years until he started to work out. Like he did no art, nothing. He felt like he was just kind of existing, not, mm -hmm. not drinking too much, but existing. And then he started to run and that became his engine to fuel his creativity as well. Suddenly he was thinking clear. Suddenly he wanted to do the art that he used to do. And it was like an entry point for him. And so like to hear, to hear someone like you talk about the physical stuff as well is it's just like, I'm getting a double whammy here. And it's really reminding me of how important it is that I need to treat my body like it's an actual thing, you know? Yeah, because you're with it the whole time. And I think we are made for action. Again, when I look back in history, we had to carry a lot of problems with us, like physically. And, and you know, and, and I, I think that we, we have missed it. We, you know, we missed that. We, yeah, I think it's important to, to keep moving, 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 you know. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. But the thing, I, I, like, for example, the idea of the video, and, and yeah. just to play around, sometimes... I wouldn't like that in my album. Yes, you know, yeah. it looks, <laughs> but for some reason, it's something that I keep more like a private thing. I love having a private life that is fulfilling in itself. And then when I show stuff, I flirt yeah. with the people because um, art is about that. It's about provoking imaginary stuff to other people and provoking thoughts to other entities and trying to bring the best out of them. Not for them to repeat the name, that who created it. And I think that's also one of the problems of our time is that we get the person uh, and we put them as responsible for what he's doing. And I don't think that's a fact. I think it's nature that makes us do stuff without the person being aware sometimes completely or making, pro mm. making errors and making mistakes that as a person you wouldn't look up, you know, it wouldn't be like a nice thing to see, but we put it together with the name. And I think that's actually sad. Even in the case of Jordan Peterson, uh, sometimes like I feel that every, once you say that, everybody will be like, boom, putting you together with that. Not knowing that maybe he says something that was magical for me. Mm -hmm. And it happens to be him, but it's not him. It, he, he doesn't even know that he was a vessel for right. that idea for all those books to go through his mind. And he brings it out. So we are all collaborative yeah. things. Nobody should be the one. Uh, admired or appreciated for that, you know? Yeah, I think that's a profound observation. And Jordan Peterson is a good example of that because he is very transparent with his thought process. Like he's not, he's not a Jordan Peterson presents kind of guy. He really, what is so attractive about a lot of his work for a lot of people is that he has this humble transparency about what he's thinking and how he's coming to terms with what he's thinking. And that's the thing that is, you know, triggering great things in other people. And and so I think that he's a character who does retain humility, and I think that you're like that as well. And it's great that you recognize that, because, yeah, it starts like a like I'm kind of, I'm half joking about this workout idea, and then we're able to articulate why that actually, yeah, wouldn't be the best in a strict sense. And I struggle with that personally because, you know, I, I do want to grow my following. 
I, I try not to obsess about that. I try not to think about it. But I do hope that I, I have some measure of success that allows me to do more of what I like to do. You know, I have like a, there's a complex there for sure. And I know that things that I can do to drive engagement is to let people into certain parts of my life that are maybe best kept private. And the one area that I've learned to keep private is my family life. I, I don't really talk about my children. I never really say their names in social media. Um, you'll see maybe a picture or a snippet here and there, but I try, I'm try. i trying to kind of keep a separation where you're not necessarily seeing the full everything behind the picture that doesn't apply to actually what is useful, hopefully, you know? <laughs> so I kind yeah. of get that. I mean, yeah, art is for is to share. That's the point of art. That's why I share my videos are... I, uh, as artistic as I can make them on my paintings. And that's what I share because it's not mine. It's not me, you know, the, my part that is me and mine, I'm like, why would I share that? You know? So I, I agree with that um, because everybody's different in that sense. You know, I'm not someone that will say, get up in the morning and do this routine. Yeah. Maybe someone wants to do it at night or maybe wants, someone wants to be obese and not do it. Like, I believe that's all perfect. I don't think there is a problem with any of the, I mean, the worst thing that can happen is that you die supposedly, but it's not the worst thing because it's actually, you just miss, like if you believe in the present, right? dying feels like it's, oh, you're just going to miss one moment. <laughs> you know, Man, like when that's... you die, you're just going <laughs> to miss that a second. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting, actually. That's, you, yeah, it almost sounds kind of, I don't think, I don't think it is, but uh, it almost sounds kind of like nihilistic. It's almost like, you know, where life is sort of here and then it's gone. And uh, well, I don't know no, if I'm right in saying I that. Believe we should live fully. No, I mean, like, yeah. we shouldn't sacrifice anything to live longer. I believe right. we should have integrity, even if it kills us. Like, when I see romantic stories of, like, Socrates or, like, big, big figures mm. that, or even, like, people that had weird routines and it got them sick and killed them. I don't care. I, I, for me, that's the, we all got to die. So who cares when people die? You know, the huh. problem is to be li living fully. That's why I don't think it's nihilistic because I think it's more like passionate about life. Right, and, yeah. And how life is all that we have. We don't have death. I mean, nobody has death. You see what I mean? Like nobody should count on it. So if you want to be... If you feel fulfilled doing something that is dangerous, that's totally perfect. Right. So it's like it, you don't want to live like you're going to die in a way. It's like you want to live like you want to live. It's like live. You want to live yeah. like it's the only option. Yeah. The yeah only that's, <laughs> no, that is that is actually very inspiring and very – that is a quite, a, quite a hopeful message. I think people – don't very often we live based on fear, you know, and we we find ourselves in patterns of behavior that are they keep they keep us safe. But if we were to live more fully, as if that was the moment in and of itself worth experiencing, and not worry so much about the repercussions, I think that yeah, because better things would happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what we love about history and and books is not how long they lived; is what they produced. You know. So that's how intensely the people lived is what I like. You know, I see animals and they live intensely. They don't care about that dying. I mean, yeah, maybe in a moment of survival, but that's life. One eat each other, everybody. Somebody's going to eat us. We eat other things and everything is life is supposed to consume you and nothing stays permanent. Once we accept that, then we're like, all right. So it's actually an amazing experience to experience this right now and leave it fully accepting all. You know? Yeah, you know what? Maybe maybe we'll end the podcast with this because it, it just made me think of something. Uh, are, do you know G.K. Chesterton? Do you know any of his work? Okay, so he was a uh, philosopher and theologian and uh, influential figure in, I think, Britain in the early 1900s or whatever. Um, What's his name again? G.K. Chesterton. Okay, no. He's got some really interesting work you might find, but he he has this metaphor. He talks about 
um, how he hates the carpe diem philosophy. He doesn't like carpe diem, but he he qualifies this. He he thinks that to seize the day is exactly the thing you can't seize. The moment you want the present to grab hold of it, it is gone. And so it's it's more of like to seize infinity. Like when the lover looks at their beloved, they do not see a temporal moment. They It's as if they are looking into the infinity of beauty and glory that this person is. And so it's like not a narrowing of the present, but an expansion of the present. You're entering into something that has such depth, you couldn't possibly see the end of it. Yeah. So yeah, we're living in it. Yeah. No, I like that. Thank you so much. And I just quickly, every thinker at the end of the day, say the same thing in different ways. Um, mm. It's very easy to forget that because we live in our narrow moment with current problems that distract us from that. But as soon as we accept uh, life, it all is like very little contradiction. It's just different ways to approach the same experience of being alive, you know? So yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I feel like there's, uh, I, I feel like we might talk a little more once I hit record, but it's like, there's so much that I got to think about and it's, it's sort of making me consider my life as it is and what I'm doing to live my fullest self. And so th- thank you for your time, your insight, and maybe some other time in the future, I'll, I'll have you on again. Anytime, man. I love talking. I'm always here trapped. Uh, So (laughs) it's good to have a social life sometimes. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you found any of this valuable, please consider subscribing, recommending this to a friend, or leaving a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you happen to be listening. If you watch this on my Servant YouTube channel or Facebook page, please leave a comment and share. I love to hear from my listeners and learn from them. Learn more about me at www.servant.com. That's S-R-V-E-N-T dot com. Thank you again for your time. Now go be creative and sane.